This podcast is brought to you by North Carolina's Electric Cooperatives. This is NC Spin, an unrehearsed discussion on issues of interest to North Carolinians. Now, here is your moderator, Tom Campbell. Thank you for joining the Father's Day edition of NC Spin. We've got an interesting show for you, beginning with bills our legislature is working on. We'll talk about North Carolina's efforts to establish racial justice, and if there's time, we want to discuss COVID-19's impact on local governments. But you can be sure, as always, we'll ask the panel to tell us something we don't know. Joining our panel this week are Bev Perdue, former governor of North Carolina, John Hood, syndicated columnist and author, Chris Fitzsimon, director of the state's newsroom, and Becky Gray, vice president of the John Locke Foundation. We'll begin our uninterrupted discussion after these brief messages from our underwriters. Today's tools make you a real DIYer, and as a member of an electric cooperative, you have lots of valuable tools to help you do it yourself in controlling your home energy use and budget, leaving you free to be dad. The big issue in 2020 is healthcare. Let's talk basics. You are the key to your own personal health, but there is strong evidence that if you have a relationship with a family physician, your quality of life will be better. You'll likely live longer and you'll have 33% lower healthcare costs. Your family doctor knows you, has your medical history, and can quickly diagnose health problems. Family Physicians, your trusted healthcare advisor for life. Let's begin the spin. The headlines belong to COVID-19, but our legislature is at work. We want to check in on some of the things that they're considering. Becky, even with some lawmakers having to check in through electronic apps like Zoom and Skype and WebEx, the big task of this legislative short session is the budget. What progress is being made on a budget which is supposed to begin July 1st. Well, very very good progress in spite of, as you mentioned, some of the challenges that they're facing with the virtual meetings and and those kind of things. It's worked surprisingly well. But Tom, as far as the budget is concerned, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And there's really three different budgets going on here. First of all, we have the money that's come into North Carolina from the CARES Act, from the federal government. It's a total of about $4 billion. Now, this money has got direct pathways to it. There's a lot of strings attached to it, if you would. So far, they've spent about $1.6 billion of that. A big part of this budgeting that they're doing this session is allocating some more of that money. That money has to be spent by the end of the year. And again, this is for immediate needs due to the pandemic. The second thing they've been dealing with is the budget just for this year that will end next week. Um, They've come up $1.6 billion short of revenue because of the economic shutdown of the entire economy. You know, sales tax is the main driver of that. So that's the second piece of this budgeting is how do you stretch this out to get through this current fiscal year? And then, as you mentioned, putting together the budget for next year. And it's looking like, you know, we're going to be three, four, could be as far as $5 $5 billion revenue shortfall over the next couple of years. So the challenge, as Governor Perdue knows, is how do you put together a budget when you've got that kind of revenue shortfall? And I'll tell you, they have done so far a surprisingly good job with these mini budgets that they're doing to get over to the governor's office. We're watching a lot of this, too, to see what the governor vetoes, what he signs into law. But in in answer to your question, the progress on the budget on all All three of these fronts is going remarkably well. Bev, I was going to ask you, you've been through a lot of these cycles before, both as many years in the Senate, as lieutenant governor, as governor. Uh, What's your advice to give to the legislators? I mean, you know, what choices have they really got here? They can cut, they can raise taxes. What else? What's your advice? I wouldn't raise taxes. I learned that. (laughs) Uh, I I think they're doing a a, a good job. I don't like the fact that The CARES money has not been, in my mind, appropriately allocated. There are so many small towns and communities across the state that didn't receive the money under the requirement of a half million people. There are folks all over the state who have had really thriving little startup business entrepreneurs who are going to be bankrupted. So I think the challenges are still there, and they're doing all they can do. Cuts and furloughs are really important, and I applaud their tenacity and their courage 
and making some of those decisions. This They're is, really brave. This hard. is not an easy task, and I think yeah. I think most of us would agree with you from that standpoint. Uh, Chris, pay raises are off the table, except the legislature did provide a $350 bonus and step increases to our teachers. Now, uh, a lot of Democrats, a lot of people said, no, -uh, that's not enough. What's your reaction to that? Well, I think it's the, it's the annual debate about how much we can pay teachers. And, you know, it's worth remembering the teachers uh, are more stressed and working just as hard or harder than they did trying to negotiate this whole new uh, world we're in with uh, with COVID-19 and, and distance learning. They're going to face an uncertain return in the fall. Uh, I think picking up on, on Becky's good summary of what's happening, the challenge really is as difficult as it is to figure out the federal money. Uh, and by the way, it's interesting that a lot of Republicans in 2007 and 8 who were complaining about federal money and didn't want it are now trying to figure out how to spend it. Uh, but in addition to this federal money and plugging the hole in the current fiscal year, the real question is, as Becky mentioned, 3 to $4 billion shortfall next year. And remember, taxes aren't in until July 15th. Right. So we don't even know exactly yet how big the hole is, how big the tax collections are, which is why the General Assembly is coming back. We have a lot of challenges at the, it, immediately. I think the biggest challenge for lawmakers and the governor is what do we do about the next biennial budget? Yeah. Well, I think Chris's point, too, of, you know, the shortfall, and again, I think we can't underestimate what this is and what they're facing. And so the fact that teachers have gotten their step increases and a $350 bonus, I mean, I commend the General Assembly for finding the money to do that. Now, you know, for, for some, and I think for the teacher union, you know, it will never be enough. But I think the fact that they have, have been able to find this money, you know, and it is, it, it, it is in large part symbolic of thanking teachers for the frontline work. But, you know, as, as Bev mentioned, there are a lot of businesses that are suffering. There's a lot of industries that are suffering, right. you know, everybody, everybody's taking a hit with this. And I commend the General Assembly for finding, although, uh, albeit small, yeah. but, you know, that they have made this nod towards John, teachers. John, uh, one of the things that I, I have not heard any discussion about in any large measure is budget cuts, furloughs, layoffs, are they on the table? Well, you've heard budget cuts. I mean, that's what everybody's talking about. They've already been cut some, some reductions. The governor, right. I think, waited too long, but he did institute some constraints on spending a few weeks ago. Cuts are coming, as Governor Perdue said, furlough, furloughs are coming, uh, in, in some cases are already planned, uh, just as in the private sector. I think one of the big things that uh, was mentioned briefly, but I want to expand on quickly, is the ability of North Carolina to use federal funds in the most efficient way. The way the Congress set up the initial wave of funding was fairly tightly constrained. Yes. Yes. And we've got to consider the fact that a very obvious and and uh, devastating impact of the coronavirus pandemic and the response to it is that lots of local governments are teetering on the brink of disaster. Exactly. In some cases, in small towns, uh, some places that, that they actually are facing uh, the, what would amount to bankruptcy, certainly insolvency. Uh, we've got to be able to figure out a solution to get through that. Uh, and ability to use federal funds to their highest efficient use, I think, has got to be something that Congress acts on so that sure. the states can figure it out properly. And, Bev, you've been through lots of these situations before where the feds give, but the feds have strings and tie your hands so that a lot of it can't be used the way you feel like it ought to be used. Let's move to some of the bills that are under consideration right now. One of the bills involves Medicaid managed care, which was supposed to begin this year. The legislature is now saying they, they are, in fact, dictating it needs to begin by July 2021. Uh, Part of that bill also keeps the Department of Health and Human Services in Raleigh. It had been uh, proposed that it would be moved out of Raleigh. What's your reaction to this managed care bill? Are you, well, I'll, I'll, I was I'll asking Bev. In. I was asking Bev. I'm Beth. sorry. I, I didn't know who you were asking. I, I, my reaction is that I agree that DHHS should remain in Raleigh. But I do think the General Assembly has a great opportunity to move some of the other big departments out into the state. There's too much concentration in Raleigh. I don't believe with all that's going on in health care today, with the confusion, the disruption, there's any way we could do managed care before 2021. I'm going to be curious if it can even be implemented there. And all in all, uh, the whole health care arena is very problematic to the state of North Carolina. We don't know really what's happening until we can get a breath 
Chris, another, another, another bill, Chris, that is being considered uh, is a transportation bill. We've talked before on this show about all the problems that DOT is having uh, and auditor's report and so forth like that. Uh, in this transportation bill, however, it's going to change the way the Department of Transportation Board is named. 14 members will come each from the 14 uh, transportation districts in our state. And then instead of being able to port, uh, uh, appoint the rest of the members, the legislature is carving out six memberships, three from the House, three from the Senate. Your reaction to that? Well, I think it's an odd time during the middle of a pandemic and a budget crisis to be trying to uh, take more power away from the elected governor. We've had governors. We have one on the panel today. We've had a lot of problems with DOT off and on during administrations that are Democratic and Republicans. This is the first time we've now decided we're going to give the General Assembly appointment power and take power away. It also seems like a last minute uh, uh, bill to, as we're trying to crunch and get through uh, this initial session. Uh, I think this one is better to wait. Let's address the problems at DOT without taking power away from the governor. I think this is exactly the time that we need to do this. I mean, we've seen this overspending. We've seen mismanagement. As Chris mentioned, this has been going on for, for decades through Did several administrations. When governor Martin was governor and there was a problem in DMV that we were going to take appointments away from the Department of Transportation? Well, Chris, there's I mean, what, still the majority of the appointments are with the governor. And if the General Assembly is going to be expected to come back and clean up messes that have been occurred the under question, the administration, well, we they ought to have a voice on the governance of it. Why didn't we do this when we had Republican governors? Well, why we now, probably why, should why, have. Why, 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 well, I mean, well, what we we're probably, talking yeah, about... Imagine, okay, yeah. only one at a time, please. Just one at a time. I can't so, hear I mean, all of you. Saying that we're literally talking about power and appointments and taking power away without any study, any discussion about it. We had a bad audit at DOT. We've had 20 bad audits at DOT, and we ought to fix it. I don't think giving Phil Berger and Tim Moore the ability to appoint at-large members is going to solve all the problems. Well, but it's a step in that direction. It's a step of authority, and it's also a step of accountability. And, you know, yeah, we, we, can, we can put this off and study it for another 20 years. Services Commission and let Paul Coble appoint everybody. Maybe that'll solve the whole problem. All right, let's change subjects here. Uh, John Hood, Please. Uh, uh, one of the things that's going on right now is a, a real problem. We talked about local governments before. One of the executive orders, and I think I understand why it was done, but Governor Cooper said those people who are affected by job losses, economic problems, and so forth like that, would not have the utilities cut off uh, in the event they didn't pay their bills. Now, Electricities and a lot of the local utilities and so forth are saying, wait a minute, this is driving them further into a hole. You think anything's going to be done about that? Well, about that DOT board, uh, no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, this is this is a significant problem. In fact, the municipality of Lagrange has filed a, a suit, uh, trying to challenge the governor's executive order because they want to be able to collect their utility fees. Uh, you can completely understand the the desire to suspend uh, terminations of service for people uh, because. Of, the economic con conditions are what they are. Lots of people are out of work. The problem is that local governments, uh, because they cannot turn off service, there are people who aren't paying their bills because they don't foresee that there's any, not, not only will their service not be cut off, but they'll probably, they think, never be, be forced to pay yeah. their bills. Yeah. And this sounds like a trivial matter. It is not a trivial matter. In some places, it's, you know, a third of the customers, a quarter of the customers, 20% of the customers, is a significant problem. And we're going to have to restore the ability of these local governments to collect fees, which involves also termination of service for people who can't pay. Now, should we come in and help people who can't pay their bills in some direct way? Yes. But I don't think suspending uh, termination and therefore really suspending collection of service fees to local governments is the right answer. If the state is going to preclude localities from collecting revenue for the services they provide, then frankly the state's going to have to make Back the up. localities whole yeah. for that. Exactly. Yeah. And, and of course city and, and county governments are the creation of and are controlled by the legislature to start off with. Bev, I want to switch gears here. Um, a lot of discussion going on, a lot of communities, Raleigh instituted uh, mandatory face masks uh, Friday afternoon, uh, Durham's had it for some time, Chapel Hill, a number of other communities across the state. There's a lot of discussion about the fact that Governor Cooper next week might uh, de decree through executive order that North Carolinians wear face mask coverings or face coverings. Uh, 
the question I think that's being asked is, does he have the authority to be able to do that as governor under the emergency powers? Uh, should he or should this be a legislative matter? I think the legislature is too busy doing what they should be doing, which is working on the budget. The governor has the power under the executive act. He can do what he wants to do uh, and then let them take him to court. The data on the face masks, masks is pretty clear. I think the CDC let us down and the World Health Organization when they didn't recommend face masks initially. We now know that the droplets in the air are very transmissible. The masks are really important, not for just yourself. They don't help me much, but if I wear one, it keeps me from spreading it to you all. Yeah. I hope he does it. I don't know if he will. California did it yesterday. I think Florida must do it. Uh, it it's just a, a, something that some people hate. We are seeing in Craven County, where I am now, that most people are wearing masks. It's, it's pretty impressive to me. And then I was in Raleigh earlier this week, and you see very few masks there. So I, I, it's just the urbanites maybe who are fighting it. Let me switch gears again. Uh, Becky, uh, earlier this week, uh, Governor Cooper and the State Board of Education issued a plan in response to a court order by Judge Lee about the Leandro lawsuit. Uh, and they, their plan was to spend $427 million, much of which goes to teacher pay increases, uh, but to spend $427 million to try to settle uh, the inequities in funding uh, in, in North Carolina counties. Uh, the big question that Phil Berger raised is, where's that money going to come from? Right. We already got a problem here. Um, now, isn't this a, a situation where we're between a rock and a hard place? The court's telling us we got to do one thing. Now, the legislature's saying we ain't got the money to do it. How do you resolve this? Well, and, and let me just throw another wrench into the discussion. How are you going to have school when it opens or doesn't open in the fall? So, you know, it's not just the <laughs> money and the resources. It's how are we going to deliver education um, for the next year? I think the timing on this is, is incredibly clumsy. I think the issue, of course, is always, and, you know, North Carolina, I'm very proud of this, is that, you know, we have always made education a high priority in this state, and this continuing discussion of how do we ensure that all kids get the best opportunity that we can possibly afford them is a, is a continuing discussion that we need to have. Right now to say, you know, again, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars are going to have to be spent immediately when we do, we're, we're trying to figure out how to get the doors open. And then also this whole challenge of the online learning and how right. we're going to do that. So I just think I think the timing on it is is really clumsy. In fairness, in fairness yeah. to Judge Lee, uh, the, the coronavirus had not struck when he issued this edict. And I suspect they've already postponed it once. They probably could do so again. Well, it also raises the question when you start talking about, you know, allocating this money, you know, in what case does it become a court order and then you get into the question of separation That's of powers what I say. and you know those kind of things it's so, a rock and a yeah. hard and, place and, kind of situation chris right. let me let me switch gears uh earlier in the session there was a proposal that came out of the house uh in which uh, speaker moore particularly wanted to see a 3.1 billion dollar bond referendum put on the ballot uh, come November, primarily for universities, community colleges, uh, some roads and things of that nature. It's moving, we understand, through the House. Number, number one question, uh, should this bill be passed into law? And number two, would the voters of North Carolina approve it right now? Well, I don't know what the voters would do. To answer your second question first, I think we don't know what the, what the economy is going to be like. We know it's still going to be struggling. We don't know uh, what the coronavirus will be like. We don't know what the unemployment rate will be. I think it's a real question. I do think uh, North Carolinians have a history of investing in infrastructure. You can argue that when the economy is not doing well and interest rates are low, that it is a job creator. The problem is I do think it'll pass the House, but the Senate leadership doesn't seem to have much appetite for it. All right. I don't have much time left in this segment, but, John, I have to mention the fact that on Tuesday is election day for the runoff in the 11th Congressional District. Uh, quickly, what are you hearing on that? What's the turnout going to be? What's your call for that election? Um, I, I don't know wh whether Cawthorn or Bennett is going to win, but I will tell you that the turnout is modest. It's a little better than you might have expected in the middle of summer during a pandemic. And in particular, the share of the vote for this runoff cast with a mail-in ballot 
is certainly higher than normal, but it is not nearly the levels that we had, predicted. That, that we had heard predictions of a all couple right. of months ago. Let's move on. North Carolinians, like all people across the nation, have joined in protests demanding racial justice and police reforms. Our Supreme Court ruled the repeal of the Racial Justice Act was unconstitutional, and those on death row uh, have insisted that race played a role in their sentence uh, can proceed with those claims. Governor Cooper has formed a task force, meantime, to address racial inequality, saying blacks are six times as likely as white to be incarcerated, more likely to be stopped by cops, and receive sentences 20% longer than whites. Beth, the Racial Justice Act was passed when you were lieutenant governor. Uh, death row inmates could appeal their, their death sentence uh, to a life, to have it commuted to life in prison. Uh, if they could demonstrate that race played a factor in their trial or in their sentences, the Supreme Court now says uh, that the repeal that the legislature passed back in 2013 is unconstitutional. Uh, and what do you think of this verdict? How big is this? It's a huge verdict for uh, equity. I, in, in my opinion, I've always been a supporter of the Racial Justice Act. I think if you look at the data that Cooper has offered to the people, the 6% figure is, is not even equitable in terms of the death penalty cases. If I'm poor, if I'm African American, if I'm educated, then the chances of me in a murder trial going to death row are very significantly higher than me if I'm a white person able to afford the best lawyer in America. It's wrong, Tom. The Racial Justice Act allows people to at least uh, offer a case against racial bias yes. in the determination of the, of the uh, outcome. Yeah. I, I hope to see that we can reinstitute something. It may not be just the racial justice parameters, but I'm really hopeful that the General Assembly and the Governor's Commission will move forward with some kind of protections wrapped Well, Chris, around. I wanted to ask a question about that. I don't, I, I, okay, the legislature did, I think, a good thing in passing the step one uh, uh, act, which will give judges the authority to, to ease sentences for first offenders and minor offenses and so forth. And of course, we talked about last week that they can expunge now criminal records uh, for minor offenses. I'm not hearing a, a, a plethora of bills coming out of the legislature on uh, police reform and uh, things of that nature. Uh, are they there and I just don't hear about them? Well, you certainly, I don't know. I mean, I think we do need to hear about them. I hope that if they don't take it up before they leave this time, that will be an emphasis when they come back to do the budget. Uh, a lot of states, some states are having special sessions. Other, some states, even with Republican governors, are having legislation introduced to change police tactics. I do think this is really important. I think the Racial Justice Act, getting back to the original question, uh, is something that was passed. Not, it, I think it's really important, and you mentioned it. Nobody gets out of prison. There was a Republican candidate. Republicans ran for office not too many years ago claiming that people were going to get out of prison and come to your neighborhoods. It's about air, fairness in how the capital punishment is applied. That's it. Yeah. Uh, there's an organization, John, that's been formed, NC Born, uh, which is calling for dismantling uh, local law enforcement agencies uh, and doing away. You wrote a column about this this week. I've got about a minute left in this topic. Uh, let's talk about that. They want to ban tear gas, rubber bullets, no-knock warrants. They want more transparency. They want uh, law enforcement people to be, wear, uh, be required to wear cameras. If they don't, they could be charged with a felony. Uh, what's up with all of that? Some of those ideas are worth considering. Some of them are preposterous. Uh, very few of the uh, demands of this organization are going to be taken seriously because of the other proposals that it has, that, that, it's, that, that it is supporting. I mean, the defund the police part of the protest message is very unpopular. And the more they talk about that kind of thing, the more they distract from things that could, in fact, have significant bipartisan support, police reforms, changes in the uh, transparency requirements. That's the kind of thing I think the legislature and local government should be looking at. Uh, and many local governments are, in fact, forming uh, commissions and are doing examinations so far as their local police departments and can be applauded for that. Uh, Floyd McKissick, <laughs> Senator Floyd McKissick, made an interesting statement last week when he said we need more training for our law enforcement people. He said that uh, law enforcement agencies are required to have only half the amount of training that it would require 
to become a barber in North Carolina or a hairdresser in North Carolina. Uh, we going to see more training coming out of here, Becky? Yeah, I think so. And I don't, more or I would argue better training. Um, you know, just real quick, I think probably the answer to the barber police question is we require too many hours to become a barber, um, you know, of, of that equation. But I think this is an issue that, that requires some real thought and real study. And, you know, we need to be careful that we understand and that we recognize where the opportunities for improvement are All right, in I got North about 30 Carolina, seconds not left react show. to national I'm sorry, events. i got to cut you off, Becky. That's okay. Uh, real quickly, uh, December 1 is the date this task force is supposed to report back to the governor in about uh, 20 seconds, Bev. I any expectation of this task force? No, uh, I think it's too early. I think there's too much pressure. I think there will be recommendations from uh, rank and file legislators. All right. Well, fast show. Thank you all. We've heard our spin on the issues of the day to stay informed all during the week. Sign up for our free weekly email newsletter. Uh, give your feedback and read my weekly column. Visit our website, ncspin.com, or catch us on Facebook. In the meantime, be sure to stay informed and watch out for the spin. Today's tools make you a real DIYer, and as a member of an electric cooperative, you have lots of valuable tools to help you do it yourself in controlling your home energy use and budget, leaving you free to be dad. The big issue in 2020 is health care. Let's talk basics. You are the key to your own personal health, but there is strong evidence that if you have a relationship with a family physician, your quality of life will be better you'll likely live longer, and you'll have 33% lower health care costs. Your family doctor knows you, has your medical history, and can quickly diagnose health problems. Family Physicians, your trusted health care advisor for life. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNCTV network.